Report brought to you by Truly Hard Seltzer. And we start off with Hal Steinbrenner giving a State of the Union address today to the media over Zoom. Don, you heard it. Yeah. I heard it. Uh, we'll let you hear from Hal, but let's just sum it up. Cashman's not going anywhere. Boone's not going anywhere. The coaches aren't going anywhere. And he puts the blame on the players. Now, in a way, I kind of like that. This is on the players. These players are better than the way they're playing, and it is on the players. Um, I know that fans, they want um, a piece of something to satisfy their their um, overwhelming urge for change. Uh, they want some blood, uh, especially off a, a, a terrible loss like the one they had last night. But Hal Steinbrenner is the polar opposite of his father. He, he, was, he was asked about this today. And he said, I love my dad, and he was the greatest at what he did. But a lot of the times that he made these changes, they didn't work, and he was criticized for it. So am I going to say that Boone and Cashman will be here if they don't make the playoffs? This is me talking. I can't tell you that. But I would be really surprised if there's any changes made during the season. That's not Hal's way. He doesn't think that that's the problem. He thinks the players are the problem. I don't think that that's going to satisfy the masses, Don. But that is what the owner of the team said today. It's not Boone's fault. He has a respect to the players. It's not the coach's fault. It's not Brian Cashman's fault. It's the players' fault. Hard words. That's about as hard as Hal's going to be. But I right. thought I thought somewhat legitimate. The players have really not performed. Well, I, I like it and I don't like it. I like it because we live in an era where it seems like there's no accountability to the players, right? Coaches and managers get fired because the players underachieve. The adage always is you can't get rid of the roster. It's just easier to get rid of the coach or the manager. So I, I, I like and respect that he went after what many people believe are the untouchables in sports, and that's the players. What I don't like is, Michael, while doing that, he is taking any responsibility away from the general manager or the manager that also have to be culpable in where the team is. So when you, when you put the crosshairs on one area, what you're doing is you're saying, you're the problem. It's not my general manager. It's not my manager. It's you. And I'm not 100% sure if that's the case. Because let's face it, Michael, the players are here because Brian Cashman brought them here. Mm -hmm. So if the players are a problem, then shouldn't the general manager also fall into that same blanket of criticism? And the manager was brought in here, Michael, and we've defended him, and I think rightly so, because I don't think it's all his fault. But was did the firing of Joe Girardi work? Forget about the, how he handles himself at a press conference and coddling the players. Did it work? Because the idea was Joe Girardi couldn't take us to the next level. Well, Boone hasn't done it either. So as much as I like that he has included the players, but making the players the exclusive here I think is wrong because I think it's taking the manager and the general manager off the hook. Well, I think that what this does, though, uh, I think that they will be on the hook at the end of the year. Then you take a broader look and say, well, the players are the wrong players. Um, and then you try to assign some blame. And, you know, he was asked point blank by Andy Martino, is there a playoff mandate? And he said, well, obviously, we want to make the playoffs. Well, Andy said, well, if you don't make the playoffs, are you, in fact, going to bring Boone back? He says, I'm not going to go there. He said, I'm just not. He said, I don't deal in hypotheticals. But I would think that if the Yankees don't make the playoffs, there will be changes whether or not uh, it's fair or not. Because it is, as Don said, it's a lot more um, – it's a, not, a, lot, a lot easier to fire a manager than to get rid of 26 players. So there, there are a lot of issues with this team. Um, yesterday's game was a debilitating, crippling loss. Boy, they probably needed this rain out today. And then they'll start again tomorrow against the Mets, who had their own um, embarrassing loss yeah. yesterday, but a different sort of embarrassing. And um, I just, I, I, I mean, we're going to talk to our, our listeners and, and our viewers today, and we'll get a feel on whether or not they're satisfied with the house timer said. And, Don, my gut feeling is they, they are totally unsatiated by, by his words because they wanted um, somebody's scalp today. And, and I'll put it this way to all of our listeners. 
last night's loss, that's the type of loss that people get fired. Yeah. So if you don't get fired after that loss, you're not getting fired. Because I don't know if there'll be a worse loss all year or maybe in the next 10 years because that's about as bad as it gets. The last time the Yankees went into the ninth inning of a game with a four-run lead and lost the game was 862 games ago. It just doesn't happen. It was it was mind boggling. If you if you heard the broadcast, yeah. the three of us were at a loss for words. You couldn't believe that it was happening in front of your eyes. And you know, they, they had you know, they had, had great win the night before. And then they completely embarrassed Shohei Otani in the first inning. He couldn't get out of his own way, couldn't get out of the inning, and they gave up the Angels gave up seven runs. And they were behind the eight ball, Don, because not only did he start, but they had him leading off. So once he's out of the game and they didn't move him to an outfield position, Joe Madden with a three-man bench had to somehow navigate the entire game with pinch hitting and pitchers yeah. hitting. And, you know, everybody's going to look at what Chapman did, right? What Chapman was terrible. And Chapman's been terrible for about, you know, 13 games now. But you really want to assign blame. The Yankees missed so many opportunities to, to ta- tack on runs against a bad bullpen. They should have never been 8-4. It should have been 12-4. to They should have been dead. They should have been giving up in the ninth inning. But, you know, it's funny, though. You can't blame Boone for, Boone for a loss like that. I mean, you bring your closer into a four-run lead, you don't expect him to walk three guys and give up a grand slam. You just don't. So they got to work with Chapman and straighten things out. You wonder what's going on with him. And Lucas Litke, who's been one of the most reliable relievers they have, they gave up three runs after Chapman, so they end up losing the game 11-8. Just an awful yeah. loss. And then when you hear that Howell was going to talk today, you figured, uh-oh, here it comes. That's what I thought. And nothing came other than the fact that this is well, on the players. And, and let's dig a little deeper. It's on the players. And it wasn't like he didn't talk about Boone or Cashman. He complimented them. I mean, he, he believes that they're they're the right guys and that everything they're doing is right. So it's one thing to say, well, I, there's a lot of blame to go around here, but I want to focus on the players. They're underachieving. No, it was our problem is the players. I don't think there's anything wrong with Boone. I think Cashman's the guy. I love what he's doing. I love the way that this organization is run. I love how he accumulates information and, and does everything the right way. So uh, how do you feel right now if you're a Yankee player that now it's all on you? And that's going to really, I think, irritate the fan base, Michael, because... As much as you want to criticize players, and at the end of the day, the players have to do what they have to do. But to is Cashman just that much part of the fabric that yes. him being called on the carpet is completely, completely not possible? Is he that untouchable that you can't even criticize him? I think you should, uh, you know what, I, I, I've kind of given everybody kind of a window into this, I, I think, the last couple of years. How really respects Cashman, and Cashman is kind of like a member of the family. Well, but, you know, so... I, I, but I, but I, I know what you're going to say. I just think it would be a seismic, seismic move for Hal Steinbrenner oh. to get rid of Brian Cashman. Hey, it's not apples to apples, but it kind of reminds me of the Giants with Eli. <clears throat> hey, the guy won me two Super Bowls. I'm going to do everything I can to just get him to win us a third one, even though it clearly wasn't going to happen. Now, it may not be at that level because Eli certainly looked done for a lot of those years, and I don't think Brian is done. But still, he, he can't be held accountable for putting together a roster that just doesn't look like it's functioning right now. Two games above 500 halfway through the season. And, he, and listen, I know he's accomplished a lot, Michael, but a lot of organizations have guys that accomplished a lot. Look at every dynasty. It, they all come to an end. The Celtics made their changes. The, the Red Wings recently made their changes after being a perennial playoff team for two decades and now are in a full-blown rebuild, right? The Dallas Cowboys, any great organization, Michael, is going to go through ebbs and flows and great players and general managers and head coaches come and go. You know, you just get to the end. So that, but that's not even on, not even on the table. And again, I'm not demanding him to be fired, Michael, but just to be criticized. Hal can't say I I really have some questions on how this roster was constructed. Brian's got to do a better job. We've got to we've got to evaluate at some point how we collect players and how we evaluate players. 
and how we sign players and extend players? That can't be questioned. He's God? Come on. I like him. And I think he's a terrific general manager, Michael. But there has to be some criticism in what he's done here recently. Remember, this is the guy that said, I want championships, not a championship. Well, right now, you're not even a playoff team. You might not even finish the year as a winning team for the first time in three decades. It's um, it's not what it's not what fans wanted. Let's hear from Hal. Um, where does the blame go for underachieving? Here's the Yankee owner. Myself, Cashman, Boone, the coaches. I mean, we're we're responsible, right? I mean, we're we're in charge. So at some level, we're responsible for what's going on. But make no mistake about it. My opinion, the majority of the responsibility, whether it's the responsibility of of inconsistent offense or bad base running, etc., that responsibility lies with the players. They're the ones on the field. Right. Uh, they're a group of very talented professional athletes that are playing this game at the highest level in the world. They need to fix this problem. They need to fix the problem because everyone, including our fan base, rightfully so, has had enough, quite frankly. It's enough. And they know that. And, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing them say that they're taking it seriously. They had a team only meeting a couple days ago, which in my opinion is always the best type of meeting. The peers holding other peers accountable is in my belief, the most effective type of meeting that can, that can occur. But we all can share the blame, but the majority of the blame lies with them. You know, one thing I would disagree with you, how many meetings they've had? It's all fits and starts with this team. What, 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 what have the meetings done? Now he was also asked, what makes you think this team is a good team? Well, I mean, I think series like the Toronto series, where our back was was uh, certainly against the wall, and uh, you know, playing on the road against a, a good team, the A series, coming back after losing the, the first game, you know, there's certainly been glimpses of championship caliber play, in my opinion, and um, performances. But the problem, as as you well know, is has been the consistency of that play. Now he was asked if he believes that the Yankees have the right coaching staff. Absolutely, yeah. Look, the, this. Everybody on the coaching staff has, has dealt with these players in the past. We've had some great offenses and some great teams. So, and, you know, nobody's working harder than the coaches. And, um, you know, the players, the most important thing to me always, any given year, is that the players respect the coaches, believe in the coaches. And that's absolutely the case here. All right, here's his evaluation of Cashman. Uh, Brian and I have been doing this a lot of years together. Um, he's extremely intelligent. Like I said, he understands the deal when it comes to, you know, relying on pro scouting, relying on analytics, but also building areas that all teams are building, like analytics, like performance science. Um, we have we communicate very well. Uh, there's not much that happens without him running up by me first. Uh, he knows that's the way I want it. Um, you know, I think he's I think he's done a good job. This this team that we put together leading spring training was a very, very good team. And they just haven't played up to their to their potential that I believe they still have, of course, because um, it's essentially the same team. And I'm talking about the starting lineup that um, you know we had last year and the year before. And, and these aren't aging players; these guys are in the prime. Um, they just haven't played up to their potential, and that's that's been the, the big problem. At least they haven't done it consistently. And he was asked, "Why are you all in on analytics?" I think we're all in on the analytics because it's a it's a big part of the game, a big part of decisions. And you know, we've 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 had some acquisitions that have turned out quite well that were based almost entirely on analytics. Now, you know, how had his media availability today to talk with the writers, and that's his right, and he has the right to do it. And that was before the meltdown, right? We knew that. Like, yeah, it, it was yeah. announced in out like when the Yankees were leading. Yeah. Uh, it was announced that he was going to, you know, he had long planned to talk to the writers on July 1st. So because he usually talks to them at the owners meeting and because of COVID restrictions, they weren't allowed. But I will tell you this. For him to still be all in on analytics, because he's an analytical guy just in real life. If you if you talk with Hal, he, he analyzes things. He does it. He's not a knee jerk guy. If he was on the show with with us right now. I'd say, well, you agree with the processes and you agree with, you know, how you evaluate players, but how? You have spent over $2 billion since 2010 and you don't have a championship to show for it. Now, I'm not saying like a Yankee fan, you know, with this terrible drought, but well, just dollars and cents. With all of this analytics, over $2 billion in money spent on players and you don't even have a pennant to show forget about a championship you've not won an american league championship forget about a world championship 
that would be my question that I'd ask him. You keep saying, you know, we're exhaustive in, in our processes and the way we analyze things, but it has not borne fruit. It just hasn't. And that, that's, that's something that at some point he's going to have to sit down and evaluate himself because you know, all of these processes could be great on paper, but if you're going home every year before you even raise an American League flag, then you're not spending your money wisely. But are there talent evaluators or is it just the numbers get spit out and it just gives them a list of players that fit what they're looking for, go out and get those players? Because if that's the case, then what exactly is Brian Cashman even doing? Right? If it's all the analytics, the analytics tell you, all right, what, what do we need? All right, we need a player that's got a certain on-base percentage, get a certain amount of hits, blah, blah, blah. Who are, all right, who's available? Here are the list of players. All right, go get them. You know, so are you really, like, evaluating talent? Are you watching film? Are you having conversations with players? Are you talking to the scouts? Or what can this guy can do? What can he do? Or is it just going by the numbers? Because if you're going by the numbers, is there even really a reason to have Brian Cashman? I thought the reason we have Brian Cashman is, all right, beyond the numbers, are you bringing in the right people? Are you able to anticipate, is this guy to be able to stay healthy? Is he going to be able to handle New York? Is he going to be able to handle a pressure situation of having to deal with the media every day? That's supposed to be the difference between a good man general manager and a bad general manager. If it's just if it's just a machine spitting out numbers of what players to get, well, then we talk about is there a use for a manager? Is there even use for a general manager? So that's what I'd like to know. Now, another thing that he said was they would consider going over the luxury threshold. You know, everybody's running with that and go, well, you know, he he would go over the. He said he would consider it. I don't think that they've gone to July 1st and assiduously stayed underneath the threshold when they could have gotten guys like Kyle Schwarber if they were allowed to go over the threshold that all of a sudden they're going to change. They might. They might. He said he would consider. But how does Brian Cashman actually go to the guy and say, I want I want to spend more money on top of the 207 that has not even given us a team that would make the playoffs right now? I, If you ask me, is he going to go over the threshold? I'd say, no, he's not. I'd say no, he's not. Although, obviously, he's the guy who makes that decision. It's not me. Um, he was asked, are you considering selling at the deadline? Yeah, I can tell you, look, Cash's job is to consider everything, right, and look at everything. But that's 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 not a direction I'm, I'm contemplating right now or even thinking about. But, you know, we, we faced a situation four or five years ago where we just weren't hitting, didn't have the offense, just didn't seem like we could get what we needed to get us over the top. And the difference is we had aging players, right? Players that were kind of at the at the end of their career. So we did. You know, we made some trades to uh, and we got rid of some guys. But I just don't see this as that situation. These players are in their prime. They've been incredible in very recent years. And there's no reason why they can't be incredible, again, offensively speaking, because they're in the prime of their careers. I mean, they, that's that's just a fact. So to answer your question, it's Cash's job to consider everything. But that's that's not something I'm contemplating right now. Now, he was also asked, has lack of accountability been an issue? Well, again, that's why I think that the type of meetings that they had two, three days ago now, I guess it is, are, are, are just crucial because they do need to hold each other accountable. We all have peers and we all respect the opinions of those peers. And that, that needs to happen. It did happen. It's happened more than once. They do hold each other accountable. I seem to get the sense that the last meeting was probably the most, uh, fiery, if that's the right word, of, you know, the other ones that they've had during the season. And, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, what has been most frustrating to Hal Steinberger? The inconsistency particularly of the offense and, you know, the uh, the base pad performance. But, I mean, the offense, I, it's perplexing. It, it, it really is. And finally, angry, but he will not make emotional decisions. Am I mad at what I see? Absolutely. Am I, 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 I'm aggravated, frustrated, um, angry. But that's not, again, that's not going to push me into a knee-jerk reaction to get rid of somebody that I believe the players respect, want to play for, want to win for. And, um, you know, overall has done a, a, a good job keeping that clubhouse together through this difficult three months. So I'm, I'm already hearing it on Twitter, Don. I'm sure you see it as well. Uh, I'm defending Boone. Um, uh, same old story. Again, people want their truth. They don't want the truth. They want what they want to hear. Sorry, this is what House Steinbrenner's saying. Do I believe... 
that the manager and the coaches bear some of the responsibility? Yes, because over the years, Don has actually convinced me. They get credit when things go well. What are they there for? So if things don't go well, they've got to get some of the blame. And I, I don't know how much blame to give them. But I would tell you this. The majority of the blame has to go to the players. They're the ones that aren't performing. Gleyber oh. Torres is not performing. Giancarlo Stan can get on the field. Brett Gardner had a good day yesterday. He's not near his career numbers. They are not performing. It's not Boone and, and Tims and Pelletier and Mendoza and Blake. It's the players. It's ultimately on the players. Because you know what? If the players have a great year, like next year, let's say Aaron Judge has as great a year as he's having now. He's going to get a big free agent contract. Not Marcus Timms. He will. He will bear all the fruits of his greatness. Not the coaches. So you're going to blame the coaches oh. if the players don't perform? Again, they deserve some blame, but I don't have the equation to tell you exactly how much of the blame they're supposed to get. But it's so odd, Michael. How, we, we do this. We've been doing this for a living. We've been doing this show for 20 years. And we've gone through the Jets being awful, the Giants being awful. Yeah, the players ultimately are the ones to blame. But who ends up paying the price when the players aren't good? It's usually the manager, the head coach, or the general manager, right? Because that's something you can do about it. So how going to get rid of these players? Good luck getting rid of Stanton, Right? Good luck getting rid of DJ LeMahieu or Gary Sanchez. How are you getting rid of these players? I mean, I would think every coach or general manager that's ever been fired ultimately got fired because the players didn't perform. So this is the one organization where it's on the players, but the, the, the manager and the general manager are exempt from criticism. I can understand the, the, the frustration from the fans. You're making sense, Michael, but every sport, every team, when you get to a situation where the players don't perform... Who eventually pays the piper? Don, I think that Boone will eventually pay the piper if they don't make the playoffs. I just don't think Hal is a believer in mid-course correction. He's a pilot. He does not believe in that. And he said that most of the times his dad did it, it didn't work. And that's true. But there were times that it worked beautifully. Right. When he went to Bob Lemon in 1978, he ended up winning a World Series. He fired a guy who loved him, Billy Martin. He went to Bob Lemon. Lemon was the calming force. They ended up winning the World Series. They don't win the World Series that year if they keep Billy. So, yeah, as things got crazy and he fired managers willy-nilly, in the words of Peter, mm. then, you know what? Then it didn't work. But there were times that it worked. Sometimes a course correction is needed. I'm not sure if that's the time. I'm not sure if this is the time. But there's something wrong with this team right now because this team is not as bad as they're playing. The talent on this team is not as bad as they're playing. I know, but as the games begin to pile up, you begin to wonder, all right, maybe it is. Does Glaber Torres have enough of a resume to say that that this is the aberration and the rule is his first two years in the league? You know, I, I, I don't I don't know. That's that's what that Brian Cashman's paid to do, right? Stan's here because of Brian Cashman. Glaber Torres is here because of Brian Cashman. He made the trade. He brought Chapman back. Right? So Everybody that's here is here because Brian Cashman thought that he was going to play, that player was going to play at an elite level. And you're 80 games into the season, and they're not. And you know what? They really didn't 60 games last year, right? Yep. They were a wild card team. They didn't win their division. They didn't win it going away. And the year before that, out of the playoffs early. The year before that, out of the playoffs early. So, you know, yeah, it's kind of bottoming out here. But you, you also have to take the deeper dive. It's been a long time since this team has won. And every single one of the players that are here, Brian Cashman signed off on. So you can blame the players, but the players that are failing you were brought here by Brian. Well, th then, it, then it becomes the age-old question, Don. Did he bring the wrong players in? Or did he bring the right players in and the players aren't playing well? well we don't know. I mean, that, that's up to Hal Steinberg to decide. Because one thing that he did do... And I'll tell you what, I think that the rules change has caught the Yankees uh, kind of unprepared. He assembled a team based on last year's baseball that the balls were going to be flying out. All of a sudden, they, they deadened the baseball, and the home run hitting team is not hitting home runs at the rate that they had before. And whose fault is that? 
Why didn't they see that coming? I don't know. But he did. He did assemble an all right-handed team in a ballpark that rewards lefties. And forget about even the short ports, because we could see Gary Sanchez and Judge and Stan. They could all hit the ball out to right field. Void. Every single one of them. But you make it easy. Easy for managers to find lanes to bring in right-handed bat, right-handed pitchers, because there's no lefties to, cook, to bring up. The, the the lineup is unbalanced. That is on Brian, and I know what Hal said. Hal brought up how important a loss Aaron Hicks was. Hey, I like Aaron Hicks a lot, but let's look at his resume, everybody. You didn't lose Willie Mays. You lost a switch hitter. Yes, a guy who was a left-handed bat who could bat in the number three hole. You lost that, but his numbers do not. You know, send up a flare that you just lost the greatest player of all time. You just, you didn't. I'm sorry. I know, but Michael, if you draft Blair Thomas first overall, is it the general manager that drafted him's fault or Blair Thomas's fault? No, you're right. You're absolutely you know, right, Don. Every player that you draft, every player that's ever been drafted, every player that has ever been traded for, you felt that you were getting somebody that was going to help you win. Otherwise, you wouldn't have made the deal in the first place. And when the player underachieves, yeah, it's on the player, but it's also on the general manager that made the move. Well, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We're going to have Alan, um, Alex Rodriguez at 3.30 to talk this through. He's been a, a very, very vocal critic of the way this Yankee team is built, and uh, he's going to do... Uh, Sunday's game, Yankees Mets uh, on uh, Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN. That's the Pinstripe Report brought to you by Truly Hard.